Well, here in Boston, Wednesday noon, the 28th of April, 1993, in the next hour or so, Sanford L. Paley, Sandy to everyone, will review some of the highlights of his life and career. He's internationally known and admired for his studies of the fine structure of the nervous system, uh, very fa fundamentally for his studies on the neuron itself and its constituents and the synapse. He was the first to clearly demonstrate its ultrastructure. The uh, thalamus, the neural hypothesis, the cerebellar cortex. The quality of these studies and their scope has brought him a long series of honors. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was elected to presidency of the American Association of Anatomists and received their highest honor, the Gray Award. He was Bullard Professor at the Harvard Medical School from his arrival there in 1961 until he retired in 1989. He's worked prodigiously for neuroscience as a teacher, as an investigator, serving on many commissions, invited to honorary lectureships and visiting professorships around the world. And he's been a most effective editor of the Journal of Comparative Neurology, which he continues to be from his home in Concord, Massachusetts. I mention these honors here at the front because uh, of the nature of uh, Sandy Paley. He's not apt to bring all of them up in the conversation ahead. To identify myself, I'm GE, that's Eric Erickson. I came to Harvard in 1941 as a graduate student and had 25 happy years there. And while I left Sandy and Harvard in 1965 to go down to Brown to become the founding chairman in their section of morphology at the new medical school, we had lots of occasions for meeting, visiting one another, seeing one another at uh, scientific meetings, and sharing our enthusiasms for the history of science, of medicine, and, and anatomy. And after my retirement in 1990, a year after his retirement, I had lots of occasions to be back on the Harvard scene with a series of adjunct appointments in the, the Department of Anatomy, the Department of Surgery, at the Mass General Hospital. Anyway, Sandy and I have enjoyed a, a long friendship of a third of a century, and we're confidently looking forward to a, another third. <laughs> I think uh, that as historian and uh, archivist, I'm perhaps an appropriate person to join him in this session. Well, now, Sandy, what do you say as, as a beginning, being the good teacher that you are, perhaps you can tell us what you're going to tell us by laying out the course that we're going to run with a thumbnail sketch of your career. Well, I thought <coughs> we could begin by uh, just saying where I came from. Right, that's a good thing. And, and uh, then go on through uh, the various stages in my career, some of them more important than, right. than others. Do that, and so, to begin with, just a quick sketch of, um, as you know, I was born and brought up in Cleveland, Ohio, and went to the public schools there. And uh, from, uh, from high school, I entered uh, Oberlin College, where I got my BA, and then went to medical school. And that was at Western Reserve University, now uh, called Case Western Reserve. Um, at the end, and I, I was introduced to research during that period. And then I did an internship at the New Haven Hospital, which is uh, affiliated with Yale University. Uh, returned to Cleveland for residency. That was in, uh, and then in 1940, early 1946, I entered the army for a two-year stint, during which I was sent to Japan. Um, following the army, which means beginning in uh, 1947, the well, uh, uh, January 1948, actually. I had a, a, a fellowship at, at the Rockefeller uh, Institute, which is now a university, um, with Albert Claude. And uh, after a year there, I 
obtained my first academic appointment at Yale as an instructor in anatomy. Um, subsequently, I had another tour at the Rockefeller in 1953. And then in 1956, I accepted an appointment at, uh, at NIH in the new uh, National Institute for Neurological Diseases and Stroke. And <clears throat> following that period, in 1961, as you mentioned, I, I uh, moved to uh, Boston to take up an appointment at, at Harvard as the Bullard Professor of Neuroanatomy. And that's sort of the timetable, anyway, of, the, of my Very career. Good pretty bare outline, <laughs> but there's running through that right from the very early time, you're interested in things intellectual, things biomedical, and quite early in things cytological and on the yes. nervous system, wasn't there? Now, one might have assumed that with that, uh, I know what the honors start coming to you quite early, even in high school coming to you. So I might have imagined, hadn't I not known you, that you came from a family, perhaps, of doctors and uh, or lawyers and teachers and intellectually and very privileged, something of a sort. Is that the case of Sandy Perry? Well, and, and uh, no, it's, <laughs> it's not uh, the case, although in, in my generation, my siblings uh, uh, had those uh, privileges. But uh, no, my parents were uh, immigrants from Russia, Jewish immigrants who came in 1903 as teenagers, actually, oh, yeah. to, to America, from the region which is now in, uh, in, is now in Belarus. Yeah. It, it's the region around Minsk. At, at the time when they lived there, it was part of the Russian Empire, like Russia, and subsequently, after the First World War was given to Poland, but as you know, they lost it recently. Uh, now, we'd like to explore that, but you've t told me before you don't really know much about that background. No, I, so. I don't know much about the past history of the, of the families. Um, the, they, they never wanted to talk very much about their life in, in Russia. It wasn't very pleasant, and in general, they tended not to tell us about it. Um, so we heard some some anecdotes and, of course, uh, fa family stories, but not uh, nothing in very much detail. Right. They were intent on becoming uh, good Americans, Americans weren't they? right. Yes. Came with knowing so little English. But so they, they came, um, of course, independently. They met, my, my parents met in, in America, um, but they, they came uh, without any knowledge of English at all. And so they started going to night school, which was available to immigrants, and in fact is how most of them learned English. But they were intent on, on uh, becoming Americans as fast as possible. And they, they learned English uh, very well and spoke without an accent, which is yeah, quite, a, quite good. Many distinguished professors couldn't have that <laughs> about them. Yes. No, that speaks something about their ear and their intent. Um, well, now, what section of Cleveland was this? This is, uh, we lived on the east side of Cleveland. Uh, the, before I was born, the family lived really rather far downtown in the 30s, as the, the streets were, were numbered, beginning at the, at the uh, public square in the center of downtown. Um, and then, by the t when I was born, they had moved to a house in, uh, in, uh, on 80th Street, moving eastward. And soon afterward, a couple of years later, they, f uh, they found, um, or they bought a house which consisted of a, a, a building of uh, housing four families. So um, we occupied one of the how one of the suites and my father's father and his, at, at, at that time, un, as yet unmarried siblings w lived in the, the next one on the floor. And subsequently, my mother's sister and her family lived in one of the 
apartments above us, and the fourth apartment was rented. Yes, typical of many of these families, as soon as they got settled, they brought their yes. parents. Yes, yes. Well, that's my, my, both of my parents were the oldest in their families, and they, uh, <clears throat> they worked very hard and, and, and brought all the, almost all the members of their families in, independently, all before they were married. Yes, but not too easy to do because no. by the time you knew them, we were in but, the 30s. I, I tell you, I mean, your conception of growing up and going to school was in the Depression. Well, yes, in the well, late 20s and, and yes. in the early 30s. That's true. Now, this is a section of uh, <coughs> uh, pretty far to the east and, uh, and a lot of independent houses. At, uh, yes, it was mostly independent houses. There were a few uh, uh, small apartment buildings, I think, most of the ones that I've, I remember were really built after we moved there. there it wasn't that kind of, yeah. of Now, area. this is not too far from uh, famous Euclid Avenue that ran right down About to... About a mile and a half yeah. from Euclid and, and Superior Avenue, too? That it yes. Like. Well, very close, we were close to Superior Avenue. We moved... Yeah. The, the, um, the house was on, on a short street called Orville Avenue, which intersected with 105th Street. Yeah. And that was the, the main uh, oh, yes. shopping for, uh, right street. Way out there, but, yes. but still in Cleveland, not into right, correct. the town of Euclid would be coming up soon. Oh, but that's far. Right, that out. was far away. When I was a youngster and living, living in Cleveland, Euclid seemed to be, oh, I mean, you'd, go, you'd go to Euclid when you thought you were going for a, a, a Sunday drive to look at the countryside. Yeah. Now one of my brothers lives there. <laughs> now, this, Euclid is a, nice, it's a very appropriate name for an intellectual. How did that yeah. moniker get on that avenue? Do you know? Well, you, I don't know specifically, but Euclid and other Greek uh, heroes um, were um, famous names all over the Midwest. You find many uh, towns with streets named yeah, Euclid. Right, a lot of a famous areas. one, of course, is the street on which the Washington University is in, in St. Louis. It, it's on Euclid Street. Yes. I, I have a vague memory. I, I meant to ask you about this some other time, that it was mapped out very carefully and geometrically uh, along some geological lakeshore and was therefore a name for the, the geometry involved. Well, anyway, you were in a... That I don't know. But this, is a, this, is a very, uh, <coughs> this is a mixed neighborhood. Yes, it was, a, it was a mixed neighborhood with people of all sorts of... Uh, um, Economic and and uh, ethnic uh, origins. There were, there was, it was in, in no way a uh, concentration of of any any kind of uh, ethnic group. Yes, and you know. your high school was very important in your career. You were you were lucky to have had some very good teachers. Could you tell us something? Yes. About well, the one who was most critical for probably for my later development was the biology teacher. Who, uh, whose name was uh, Mr. Goldbach. Goldbach. And um, he seems to have uh, recognized me uh, right. er, fairly early. And he suggested that I should uh, apply for a, a scholarship at Oberlin College. No one in our family had gone to, away from home for education. My older two brothers had, had uh, gone to Western Reserve, or, or were at, the, at that time in at Western Reserve. Uh, and they commuted. That was we, yeah, well, they walked to, they yeah. walked there. Uh, or they could, in fact, taking the streetcar would take longer than walking <laughs> because of the route. Um, but now Mr. Goldbach but, was, was a good teacher of Yes, biology. he was an excellent teacher of, of biology. And, and uh, um, in the 10th grade, when I was taking this first course in, in biology, he, he uh, suggested that I might be a good candidate for, uh, for Oberlin, um, which at that time gave a, a small number of scholarships uh, on the basis of an examination. Uh, so early in the fall of my senior year in high school, the, um, I went to I went to Oberlin and, uh, and took this um, examination. I seem to remember that it took all day, but it probably didn't. <laughs> uh, probably it was only two or three hours on biology. 
And they could ask any, you, one had no idea what they would ask, so they could ask any kind of question about biology. And I prepared myself during the previous year by studying mostly uh, a two-volume book by J.J. Thompson, um, which was well known at, at that time and covered uh, uh, as this, uh, natural history, evolution, Richly physiology. Yes, very nicely yes, illustrated. Very illustrated. It was in the mode of the Julian Huxley, H.G. Uh, Wells kind of uh, education but, for it. But it was more directed to the student, whereas the, those books were lay, were written uh, for lay yeah, that's a good um, distinction. people. Yeah. Um, and you got the results of that exam? And then, the, yes, the examination was graded w at, at the end um, I, by one or two people in the zoology department. And uh, at, we were all at, uh, all the candidates were at, at uh, dinner in one of the dormitories when they announced who received the, the who would receive the scholarship, and I was lucky to receive one of them. Oh, uh, congratulations. But the same <laughs> day, without computers. Yes, yeah, yes. That's great. So that was a uh, Well, now, a here you were as, a, as a, a good high school student, and uh, I've done little researches on my own and discovered that you were almost the first class, by a hair's breadth, almost the first yes. standing scholar in your, in your class. And I might have uh, uh, imagined that you did that by virtue of uh, night and day. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, 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 grinding in your, this included in your study, but uh, well, you no, know, actually that wasn't uh, that wasn't true. I I had the advantage of what I later learned was probably an eidetic memory. Yeah. I could m memorize almost anything by just seeing it once or twice, and um, I still have this ability to some extent, it's far uh, attenuated over the, over the years, but I, I still can remember what part of a page some, some words appeared which bothered me and, and, uh, and then find it uh, afterward. And, uh, so it's, uh, it doesn't necessarily help to find your car in a parking lot, but it, it, uh, it, it is... Uh, but anyway, it, here you it were. It is something that makes it much easier to, to get on with uh, yes. learning languages, learning... Uh, yeah. And that was French uh, for you. Yes, Very learning important. mathematics, learning a, yeah. any... And any you didn't find a high school then a, a great uh, uh, worry no. or fright to you. you no, it, it, wasn't, it, w it wasn't... And, uh, and, and what's more, you packed in quite a bit. Else you started another aspect of your life there with the... Well, at the same at the same time, yes, I, I I was worked on the on the high school newspaper, and wrote articles for it, which as a reporter, and I also was attending Hebrew school during all those years. That was about that which, was at the end which, of a, yes, which meant days? four days a week four going, days a week going for about at the, how long? for about an hour at the end of uh, the day yeah. before dinner. And that was pretty purely. Uh, the Hebrew language and biblical history. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Um, well, in the first year, I started when I was five or six years old. So in the first years, one learns prayers and and uh, uh, and the language, um, and you read the Bible in Hebrew, and um, and then as you get. Farther in, in in high school, we, we did his, uh, history things that aren't in the Bible, and uh, uh, tried to learn conversational Hebrew right. and things like like that. But not much into Talmudic. Uh, no, we, we didn't. We did. Uh, I remember that I had one semester which was was a, a study of Mishnah, but it was not very. Uh, right. It wasn't like going to yeshiva. It wasn't. Right. The, so we're this, imagining uh, one of your school days as being mighty full. It was. Uh, yeah. It, well, in, in, till, uh, in addition, I was taking piano, and and that's right. and so I had to practice every day, yeah. um, as well as okay. go once a week for a lesson. God bless your parents for studying <laughs> on that, because I remember you were playing you know, the Bach Toccata uh, to recently, and your well Steiner with lots Grand of mistakes. Concord. Yes. Yes, that's a continuing matter. Well, so here you were very well prepared, really, for Oberlin, and they knew you were by this exam. 
And so you entered Oberlin, and you're going to be in the class of? Well, I graduated in 1940. So yeah. was a... And uh, did you had a scholarship, which paid uh, some of the Yes, the scholarship, of course, was, was uh, the scholarship awarded from the examination was a one-year scholarship. Oh, yeah. But so after that, uh, from the, re the, the, the succeeding three years, I had a half scholarship. Right. That is, uh, but even that was helpful. If you you have to remember that the tuition was two hundred fifty dollars, <laughs> and uh, this seemed like an awful lot yes. for a family in the in the in the depression to to uh, deal takes, with. <coughs> plus, it took a lot longer to earn a dollar. In yes, those days. plus the the uh, the room and board, which also had to be paid. And there yes. was about the room and board. Just comparing with modern days, was about the same. It, they were about equal. Tuition was about half the total expense. Yeah. But now uh, you had good supportive uh, parents looking yes. after really four children yes. that went to college. Yes. Yes. All of us went to college. All of us went to a graduate yeah. school. Did you have any uh, paying jobs in high school or in college? Yes. I worked in the summers, not during the school year. But I, I worked in the, in, the, in the summers. I worked uh, as a what was called a floor boy at Halley's, the big yeah. department, uh, the sort of elite department store in, in Cleveland. Uh -huh. And uh, I also worked in my, I had an uncle who had a grocery store. I worked there one summer. It was, I mean, yeah. it wasn't easy to find jobs either. Right. But, but now here at Oberlin, small college town, about 25 miles or so, is it? 30, 35 miles 35 from Cleveland. West of Cleveland. So you could go home on holidays and all kinds yeah. of things. Yeah, I didn't country. usually go home on weekends. I mean, I, I only yeah. went when there was a, a, yeah. a vacation. Now, how did this little college strike you? We all know it as one of the really fine schools. It's always ranked up there in the top half dozen liberal arts colleges in this country. Well, it it was a very good uh, college, and uh, and I, I you know I feel. Uh, quite indebted for the education that I, I got there. It was very good, um, not only in teaching uh, sciences, uh, of course it's famous for its music school, uh, but it, it also encouraged extracurricular activities such as um, politics and journalism and um, and mixing the two, which you yeah, did mix, to some mixing extent the with two. your editorial. Well, in those, in, in, at that time, Oberlin had a fairly long tradition of holding a national convention every four years it, as what was called a mock convention. And they usually chose the Republican um, uh -huh. to, to pretend that they were the delegates to the Republican National Convention. Appropriate and, for Ohio. Yes. Uh -huh. and, <clears throat> um, and Although I didn't feel particularly, uh, this is during the time during uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's uh, um, administration, I, I didn't feel particularly in favor of uh, any any of the Republicans. But that was the, you know, that was the choice of of the uh, of the organizing group, and so uh, we had. A, we had this convention. I remember participating in it. I can't remember exactly what I did, but we had to give speeches. We had to go make demonstrations, and it, it was really quite exciting. They don't do it anymore. Now, now, the early years quite typically would have been ones of general distribution, wouldn't they? What were yes. the introductory courses that, that made uh, any special difference to you, made a mark, and opened your Well, mind? one. Of course, there were the, the there were the uh, science courses which I started taking right away with chemistry, uh, general chemistry, and and uh, subsequently physics, and then more advanced chemistry. But um, probably the course there were two courses that made the most impression on me in the first year. One one was uh, of course an English composition which everybody was required to take. And uh, in this course, we all we read um, Cardinal Newman's "The Idea of the University," which uh, uh, 
made a strong impression on me, partly negative because of his ideas, which I didn't agree with, and, and positive because of the marvelous style in which it was written. Yeah, one of the great stylists. Yes. Like so. um, another teacher was Robert Fletcher, I think his first name was Robert, who taught us American history. And he had a very radical idea of, of how American history uh, uh, developed. So that was quite refreshing and, and a little bit more uh, uh, thought-provoking, perhaps, yes. than what he would get in a public high school. Yeah, stimulating to independent thought. Yes. Right. Now, we didn't strike one <coughs> note of uh, something that's very important that anybody visits you in Concord would see, you being a very visual person, love art, and you have uh, beautiful prints and graphics and paintings. There. That started early for you, didn't it, that interest? Well, yes, of course, that's, that started probably when I was a child. Uh, but the, the public schools in, in Cleveland had a regular program for uh, attending um, the, the museum, the art museum, which at that time was um, e expanding. They had just built a new, beautiful building on a w wonderfully landscaped um, region with a pond and and uh, um, at this time of the year in the in the spring it, it was absolutely magnificent with the flowering trees. Well, it's one of the around. great museums. Of yes, country, and they this this uh, it, it, once or twice a year cl uh, the classes from the schools, even in the elementary school, would would make visits to the museums and and um, uh, you know be be guided through certain parts of the museum appropriate to your age group. And so I, you know, developed the, the interest that we, I would go there with friends or with my, with my sister who was younger than I was, so, you know, many weekends just, just to go as an excursion. It was always a source of great pleasure. Now, it's interesting to note that you are remembering the real values of elementary school. Yes. Yeah. high school teachers and now your college yeah. teachers and also the public library was important yes in the public library which was at the end of our street just um, just at the corner of uh, Orville and in 105th Street there was the Doan li uh, the Doan school across the street which our, was our our elementary school and and the library on our side of the street so we didn't even have to cross the big the busy uh, um, a road in order to get to the library, and I sp you spend a great deal of time there when I was a, a child. The, this, the library also had, I, I just think of it now, um, um, educational programs. They had, for example, story time, which I remember going to, in which one of the librarians would tell stories to the children. Um, they also had an art program in which you could learn drawing and painting, things like that. Uh, so, and, and I participated in one of them one, one year. I must have been in junior high by that time. Right. Well, I think it's important for, for our society to remember the important ingredients uh, that people are up to boast about the uh, contribution of higher education. But it started early. And we mustn't forget the support of your parents with those piano yes. lessons, yes. because you well, really followed the, through with our, those. Uh, my parents were supportive for all of us. The, I mean, we, they, they were, uh, they really appreciated that we were interested in learning, and they, uh, they, uh, encouraged us in in all these uh, yeah. aspects. So here at Oberlin. Which of those continued? Now, music you were well started with. Did well, you, uh, yeah, yes, I couldn't college? continue with music because, <clears throat> except as an auditor, I mean, I could, I right. could go to concerts and, and recitals, which and were good ones being, at yes, which were being given by, the, by either members yeah. of the faculty or visiting people, such as yeah. Arthur Rubinstein and George Enesco and uh, all sorts of famous people. What about art? Did you take um, a history of and art? The, uh, uh, some. Some art course was also required as a distribution, and I took a course dealing with the Renaissance painters, the Italian Renaissance <coughs> painters, which was uh, very helpful later on when I, when I went to Italy. I really appreciated 
all of the things right. that I learned. All there. you've read about, there they were in Italy. Or but Germany. for my development of my career, probably the most important uh, people were were the people in zoology, you know, most particularly Hope Hibbard, right. who taught me how to use a microscope. Uh, and we all know I, her because she was a sister-in-law of Al Romer. My right. Doctor yes. Yeah, and yes, and she Woods used to Hall, she she used to come to Woods Hole every summer. Um, but um, I, I will never forget the, the day when uh, we were given slides of frog liver or some some tissue like that from from frogs and and asked you know to examine them and learn what we could from them and I, looking down the microscope I, all I saw was sort of colors and I didn't didn't make any sense at all to me and she she taught me how to see through the microscope which was. Yeah, a very, she would be a good person for yeah, that. What about important. micro technique? Did you no? Learn we didn't. That? We didn't do any micro technique. That was there were there was such a course, but this was not advised for uh, pre medical yeah. students. So you had to so learn I, that I, later I, with the showers. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. I, I learned that actually, and by doing it in yes, medical. Yes, that's right. Now there's medical. histology. Uh, and embryology, we all know a textbook that came out of all Yes, and embryology was taught by uh, McEwen. I don't remember his first name right now. Oh. Mac, we always called him. So I, Mac, yes. Mac yes, but that wasn't his first name. Um, who had written a, a well-used textbook of, yes, very uh, clear. of, of embryology. Oh. And we studied um, the chick. And, um, unlike all our other people, Mac was someone who brought us original papers and showed them to us, pointed out, for example. I remember his bringing a, an early journal of morphology with, with uh, a paper by Conklin, which he uh, showed with easy. the beautiful illustrations yeah. that went with that. And uh, before that, one didn't really know where was all this information that we read in the textbooks. Where does it come from? And later you saw him at Woods Hole. Yeah. Isn't that right? Conklin. No, no. Oh, Conklin, Conklin. Yes, 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 I did see yeah, him. So so he was quite thing. ancient by then. All right. Now, who else in the Department of Biology? Well, there was a, um, there was a Professor Bunt Buddington who was uh, uh, who retired the in my freshman year, I believe. So at least soon after I came to Oberlin, so I didn't have any further contact with him. But he was the the person with whom. I had the most contact that day of the examination. <laughs> uh, that's very memorable. Yes. Yeah. Now, it wasn't a large department; it was a small college. Uh, yeah. It? Yes, it's a small. Yeah. Yeah, so there were there were uh, uh, later Oberlin people whom I got to know: uh, George Scott and um, Warren Walker, but they weren't there at the time when I was a student. They no. came afterward. Now, when you visited, uh, it was Warren Walker's chairman. Yes. Who was right. right yes. He was an old lab mate. Mine hmm. school. Yeah. Well, so here, but now here's another continuity. You uh, were very busy with the school newspaper. Yes, I became uh, first a reporter and then an associate editor of the of the newspaper, and was as as all people do when when had to. Um, uh, this was a weekly newspaper, so we had deadlines and right. we had to write things to schedule. Right. And as editor, I would go to the printing office and, and supervise the printing of the, of the paper, yeah. which stood me in good stead later because this taught me how, uh, well, this wasn't the first time. I also did something similar in the high school, uh, with the high school newspaper. I also went to the printer and saw how, how right. ink was put onto paper and how things right. were printed and what linotypes were like and so on. And this, this is, has given me a very good background for being a scientific editor later on. Yes. It was very helpful. Most people now don't seem to understand how does a paper become transformed into um, a published article. And there, there's just a void in between. They have right. no idea. Well, all that experience to our benefit when it sees the series of volumes you've edited. Now, so <coughs> this is so interesting stay too long here, perhaps, in the you know, charming maybe. <laughs> college of, uh, of Oberlin. In the class of 1940, you graduated. Yes. And you were heading for medicine. How, how did you come to that interest? Well, I, 
over the, um, during the college years, because of the re reading I had uh, done, uh, I became fascinated with microbiology, what's now called microbiology at that time was just bacteriology. And I took a, an elective course in bacteriology that was pre offered by uh, Dr. Jones in the Department of Botany that, that was considered under botany. A lot of microorganisms. And most of, most of this course had to do really with public health considerations rather than, than uh, academic bacteriology, but it did uh, start me in this. And then in the, my senior year, I took an elective with Dr. Jones, which involved doing an independent research project. I don't know, this is sort of amusing. I don't know if you want, if we should go into to this. Um, the ahead. course was, well, the question was, well, what should I, what should I work on during this time? The library at Oberlin was not very strong in bacteriology, and uh, that's a state university kind of course. <laughs> yes, right? and so it wasn't easy to um, you know just to go and read about it. Um, I did uh, gain access to the the library in uh, yeah. what is the name of the of the historical the, of the. Uh, medical library in uh, the Allen, Allen, the Allen Dudley, Allen. Dudley Allen, Allen Memorial Library in in Cleveland, which is now the the library for the medical school, as well as the um, medical society in in Cleveland. But um, during this, uh, 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 well, at this time, my my brother, who had already graduated as a lawyer had a classmate or a friend about his age who was a, a doctor, and he suggested that I should talk to someone in the public health department in, in Cleveland. And that person, <laughs> whose name I don't remember since I never saw him again, that person suggested that um, it would be useful to try to grow the gonococcus in culture because it's extremely difficult to grow and there are no routine methods. For, uh, for doing this, if one could in devise a routine method, it would help diagnos diagnostic work very much, and perhaps public health. So I w went to the Allen Memorial Library and read all, all the things that I could find about uh, media that had already been used. Um, a famous one at that time was called a chocolate medium because it was made with blood. and. Um, uh, had this color, the chocolate color. <coughs> now you were, so your your interest really came in through interest in bacteriology, microbiology. Yes. And you read an important book to you. Yes. Well, I I had read uh, Zinsser's uh, uh, Rats, Lice, and, and Men, yeah. along with uh, many other books. There was a famous man, Ho Heuser was his name, who went who had gone to. Serbia, which is now in, in uh, the press, uh, uh, right after the First World War, uh, to try to stem a typhus epidemic, yes, and he became very, the, yes, he became very famous well, because he had he had he had gone all over the world trying to contain plagues right. of one sort or another, and he had written a biography that also fascinated yeah. me. So this all seemed very exciting to me. But Zinser was, Zinser was yes, and Zinser was the one I thought I would really like to study under, yeah. and he was he was at Harvard. Rats so, slice in history. Yes, that was it. Yeah. Right, rats slice. And then, as I remember him, it was published just the year you were graduated. And yeah, so I had just that. I had just yeah. it was new at that time. Yeah. So, um, so you decided well, to go I took or? I did yes I had taken I had done this project and tried to grow things in. Anyway, it gave me. Uh, experience in laboratory work, which I didn't, you know, original attempts at doing something original, which uh, I hadn't had an opportunity to do before. So that that uh, um, encouraged me even further, and um, so when I broached the question of how how do I get further training. My advisors, including Hope Hibbard and, and the professor of, of organic chemistry, um, Lothrop, 
um, said, that, well, you have to go to medical school. I mean, that's the way to, to, that's the path to go along. And so, as a result, I applied to Harvard because I wanted to work with Zinsser, and that's where he was. Why not? And uh, that was the only school I applied to under the oh, advice. Right. <laughs> under the advice of my, yeah. my sp uh, sponsors. Well, and of course I was declined. <clears throat> so um, soon afterward, I uh, applied again. This is now late in, the, in 1940, uh, late for applying to a medical school in March of, yeah. the, of the year. I applied to, Cle uh, to the uh, Western Reserve because in Cleveland I could live at home and it would cost the family less to put me through right. medical school. <laughs> and I was accepted there, so I went to Western Reserve. Fair enough. And that is um, then in the fall of... Of 1940. Yeah, 1940. Yes. And now, the, uh, of course, the war had already begun in Europe. Yes. And didn't know what was coming for no. you and the rest. But here you were, Western Reserve. You commuted the four years. And uh, you had... Uh, you still had your eye on... Microbiology, on, on microbiology. Though you right. had excellent courses in anatomy, and yes, tell us about that the first. Well, year. the the first year, uh, we had of course gross anatomy, and um, and histology, um, and also neuroanatomy, <coughs> and um, uh, chemistry. I think those are the courses of the first year. Yeah. don't remember that we had any other ones. Yeah, Physiology was a second year yeah. course. Yeah. Uh, and and a, ma a major amount of time was spent in the, in, in the anatomy department because of histology, uh, gross histology and neuroanatomy. But I was very lucky because our teach my teachers were really marvelous. Um, Norman Herr had just come the year before to be the chairman of anatomy, and he helped to teach Gross. Great contrast with his predecessor. With his predecessor, right. And, um, and both Gross, well, in fact, all the members of the department taught in some way, at least to some extent, taught in all, all the courses. So um, I, was, I was very lucky that in Histology and neuro, the t uh, my teachers were Ernst and Berta Scharr, foremost, and, uh, and David Bodian, who was there just that time. He was in Cleveland for about a year and a half. Fresh from Chicago? Uh, yes, coming fresh from Chicago and already uh, commuting to Baltimore, where he finally settled after the, that year. And now you are preparing his obituary. Y yes. 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 After his years at Hopkins. Right. Yes, well, that, that was a very uh, humane department, was it not? These were empathetic people. Who yes, it was really, really very good. We had excellent, excellent lectures and, uh, and a lot of uh, attention from the, from, uh, the teachers. And it, 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 they were the most uh, inspiring courses. Unfortunately, biochemistry was not e exciting. Um, at that time, and yes, at, at that time, yeah. and um, subsequently, some very famous people j joined the department. But, but that was after I, I graduated. It was after the war, in fact. What about physiology? In in physiology, which was a second year course, it, uh, this was taught by uh, Carl Wiggers, who was oh, a yeah. famous uh, physiologist. But that was a second year course. Yeah, you know, that was oh. in the first semester of the second year, physiology and pathology because it was quite a common pattern to have anatomy in the fall in the right. whole block system and right. physiology and biochemistry. Yeah, but no, it, 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 at that time it was a... But here you are in this marvelous uh, department, but you're, uh, you were still on well, the I was still interested in, in microbiology. And so I went to, in the, uh, in the spring, um, the, the, college, the, the medical school offered uh, a small number of summer scholarships for students who would be interested in doing research in, in several departments. And so I went to the, the 
department closest to bacteriology and asked them if I could uh, could work in what, with one of their people. And the answer there was that, well, you haven't taken our course in bacteriology, which is a second year course, and so we don't take students until they've had their course. That's reasonable. So I was uh, blocked there. and. Um, I turned to the people who were most inspirational in the first year, which was Ernst Scharr. That and, was a lucky turn. Yes, I and I asked him if I could if I could work with him, and so I applied for the scholarship and got it, and and he put me to work in the spring, even before the end of the school year, to begin to learn histological techniques so that I could right. do. Well, that's where that came. Now the these were Kryle fellowships, named for. Yes, the they George were named Kryle. for George Kryle. I think he, he gave them money, the money for it. In fact, he was still alive then. Now, you started working with the Shires really before the summer. Yes, I began, began in the spring semester, in the, yeah. during the spring. Well, now, Sandy, these Shires are going to be very important mm. people in your life, throughout your life. And uh, tell us, who, who were they? Where did they come from? Well, Ernst and Bertha Schauer were Germans who were brought up in Munich or the region around Munich. And Bavaria, yeah and received their degrees there from the university. Um, and they had been trained, really, by the previous generation of famous uh, zoologists and, and, uh, and uh, medical people. So uh, uh, for example, both of them had been students of von Frisch, who later received a Nobel Prize for his work on the bees. But as uh, during, they received their degrees, I think, after Hitler became chancellor, um, and during the during the rise of Hitler, they became more and more uncomfortable in the in the uh, with the tenor and development of of the regime. You can't Although, imagine a more un-Nazi no, right. pair than the first right. Ernst. Could and be. although they were not Jewish, they didn't have any, uh, they were presumably not in any danger uh, for ethnic reasons, the, it, it was very likely that they would express themselves in perhaps the wrong places at some point. It, it was uh, extremely difficult. Um, uh, Ernst's father, I think, was a postal uh, a civil servant in the postal service. So that there was also this problem that his his father was in in a government position uh, yeah. and might be in some danger. So um, Ernst had had a, a Rockefeller Fellowship. I think in 1928. I may be wrong about the exact year, in which he came to Yale and spent a year in Ross Harrison's laboratory. Um, so he had already made a contact with America, and. Um, that's the zoology department, not yes, medical. That's the zoology department. They are department. biologists in their right. background. Right. Right. And so he uh, he obtained he applied for and obtained an, an, a new Rockefeller uh, Foundation grant to come to America, and they went to the University of Chicago. And on the in the on the way to this. On the way to America, they, they proceeded by way of the Pacific. They went around the world and, and stopped in various places, and even, even visited Africa. Uh, so by the time they arrived in, in, uh, in Chicago, it was already 19, late 1938, I think, or early 39. It was pretty clear, I think, to all of them what what kind of developments were going to happen by this time. And um, uh, well, after, after a, a, a year or so there, they then moved to New York, where they spent a year or at the Rockefeller Institute. And it's at this point that Norman Herr picked, picked them up and brought them to Cleveland. Um, they had, by this time, decided that they would not have any intention of returning to, to Germany. Um, 
and, uh, and so they set about uh, Americanizing themselves and, and improving their English and so on. Well, and so it's at that point when, when, uh, when I met them. And this was a new chapter in your life. Well, yes, not, yes. You made me well, out. they were very impressive people. For me, they, they really represent a, represented a high of, of, uh, of scholarship and commitment and culture. And it, We'd like to think it's, typical Germans, right? Yeah, well, I don't know how typical they are, but certainly they represented the the, the right. best of the of the yes. ac academic uh, cultured uh, group. Right. Yes, of people. Uh, profoundly based in their own science, yes. but also in the whole cultural milieu. Right, in, and interested in everything. So my contact with them was extremely enlightening and and educational in all respects. Yes, and this wasn't the professor in his study somewhere that you come in question. You were working uh, elbows. Uh, yes, I was working uh, in, the, in the same laboratory, helped them in modest ways with, with their uh, particular uh, work. For, for example, all through medical school, if I, had a, if, if I was in the laboratory and they had a um, uh, tissue which had to be carried through, processed, I mean, I would dehydration. Yeah, I would run that for them, and if I had to go home for dinner or so on, and they were staying, they would run my things through. I mean, it was a sharing, in, in all respects, and I help. I helped them with some of the surgery that that um, especially Ernst was concerned with when they went away. Um, Berta, who worked on cockroaches, had to make sure that the roaches were fed and and watered and so on, and I would do that as, as well as some of the other students, like Stu Smith, who was a, and this a was classmate a, of mine. This was an enormous commitment of, oh, you would be back in the evenings. And oh, yeah, we and lived there. You lived really. there. And uh, I, we I, lived in I the remember medical you, school. Uh, Sandy, from various talks in the past, usually uh, having great experiences walking people home or, or <laughs> something. Isn't that yes, true? well, then they usually left. Uh, about 10 o'clock or 10.30, and, and, and they lived two blocks away from the medical school. Right. So I would, and I lived about a mile away, so I would walk with them to Euclid Avenue, and uh, we would stop on the corner there and have our final conversations under a lamppost. And, and they would then go on to their uh, apartment, and I would continue uh, uh, on home. So this will happen almost every night. Yes, but now it's important. Uh, they could no longer go to Woods Hole. Had to go to a more to a nearer lab, and you went. Yes, with during the collecting. yes during the war because of the of the uh, restrictions on travel, uh, they stopped going to Woods Hole every summer, and in, in one summer we went to. to um, a, uh, a marine, it's not a marine, it's a lake station in Putin Bay, which is in the western end of, of, uh, of uh, Lake Erie. Fame. Yes, where the Battle of Putin Bay took place in 1812. And um, the, the Ohio State University has a station there, a biological station. And uh, we went there to collect a marine, uh, to collect uh, uh, fish. Fishes. We collect all sorts of fishes, and um, and perfused them, uh, and then brought the materials home. Yeah, very afterward. importantly, you, you perfused them. Didn't take yes. out the organ and pickle yes. it. Uh, yeah, we perfused yeah. all all of the animals uh, that uh, different kinds of whole series of different kinds of fishes that were native to that part of the of the uh, lake. Well, this, all this collecting of specimens, perfusing, preparing <coughs> specimens, well, it was in quest of what? Well, you, you may remember that Ernst had discovered what he called glandular nerve cells in, uh, in a uh, European fish, a minnow. And, um, and over the years, he had looked at various uh, vertebrates. And fishes have a, 
express this glandular aspect very well, so that it was it. it we, we wanted to get a collection of uh, American freshwater fish that, who, who might be uh, possible subjects for experimentation um, once we had examined them. So we were looking at different species in order to find um, one that might be the, the best subject. Um, the neurosecretion is, uh, sh shows up as droplets in the, in the nerve cells. Um, so that it looks like a cell in the pancreas, although it's two nerve cell. So these, these hypothalamic cells, of course, later were discovered to be the source of antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin and other very important uh, um, chemicals. Well, we, we think of neuroendocrinology in these early days as being synonymous with the, with the Shires. Yes, the really, they really began but, it. But yeah. this was just the beginning of that, and yes. they had a hard row to hoe, didn't they? Right, because people, people didn't believe they thought there were artifacts or viruses or God knows what, you know, but what certainly I, I, no, no nerve cell could really secrete, although actually all nerve cells are secreting, right. uh, even if we don't see their, uh, right. their uh, uh, droplets they're secreting it at a, yeah. a, a ultramicroscopic level. Yes, but back then in the uh, 40s, yeah. this was heterodox. Yes. This is a Galenic notion of uh, nerves, uh, right. humors, animal uh, spirits. Uh, right, and we, it was very difficult to find out what, what was the function or the role of, of these droplets. And it, the, even though during the same period, during the late 30s and early 40s, Vigno and his group had had isolated um, oxytocin and vasopressin from uh, pituitary glands. Um, no, nobody understood what was the connection between that and the hypothalamus, and why. Are, what are these nerve cells doing, sending their axons into the posterior pituitary? What's going on there? And it, this, the the clue for this. Uh, occur, uh, uh, came in 1949 when Bargmann, yes, in Kiel, applied the chromalum hematoxylin method to nerve cells. Now, this method had been used for uh, uh, as a as a stain. It was invented by Gummery in Chicago. Uh, it had been used as a stain for gland cells and um, also for elastin. And nobody had ever thought of applying it to the brain. Right. And it's not a gland. In these no, cells. no. And uh, but um, uh, Bargman had uh, had this idea, and uh, and lo and behold, he f he found all the nerve, all the animals, all, all both vertebrates and invertebrates. Of course, the, he wasn't. He didn't examine every everything. There was many people who chimed in afterward, but um, very quickly it was shown that that all of them contain uh, droplets or granules, very tiny ones, extremely small, and that um, if you um, stress an animal by uh, giving it uh, salt water to drink instead of plain water. Uh, you could change the amount of this material in the in the nerve cells and in the pituitary, and this opened the the whole subject. What a nice no. clear demonstration! Yes, until you see it. Well, this is Bergman, who were, were long lifetime, uh, long time friends of the Shower. Yes, they had known each other since uh, student days in Munich. Yes, yes. and uh, and he became an honorary member of our right. association. Standing anatomist, yes, yes. warm yes. friends, and he had a long chain of uh, of students in the developed from the the new Germans, yeah. which was very Walter good. Walter Hilt at Galveston yes. was one of those. Right. That some of the work. Yeah. Well, now this uh, this is going to be such an, uh, a favorite subject of ours. We've got to reluctantly go along, but the fact is, this was your, the summer between your first and second year at Western Reserve Medical School, so you had. Years well, ahead. Yes, actually, the the summer between the first and second years, I worked in the laboratory uh, alone because the showers went to Colorado. It, this this experience of going to Putin Bay was in between the second and third oh, yes. years, which was for the medical student was 
um, uh, a very brief pause because that was the year that the school went on to a, a, um, a speeded up schedule and all vacations were canceled. So right. we had, a, uh, I think, uh, two weeks between the second and the third yeah. year and then started in when in the third year was a, uh, began the clinical uh, work. Big revolution in the curriculum. Yes. Were you so, actually in an ASTP unit yes, then and in I was, the Army? Uh, yes. So you were so ultimately, we went yeah. into uniform and, and uh, well, it, yeah, the, it, the, the, of course. The, to get more doctors out right, quickly. Right, right. So the course, right the, the year, the, uh, the four-year course for us was done in three and three and a half years. And the next class had, of course, they had no vacations, whatever, so they, they got through in three years. Right. But you could t uh, still tuck in some work with the Shars. Yes, I continued to work all that yeah. time with the, with the Shars. In fact, right. prepared the material for my first paper during the senior year, so that it, it came out a month after I graduated. Right. And then you had, uh, with the help of the sharers, been sort of plotting out your next step, yes. which was to be. And then, then I uh, went on to my internship at at, uh, at uh, the Yale New Haven Hospital. And while I was there, I continued to work on this my what would become my second uh, research project, which I began, of course, during. I began while I was still a Western Reserve, but I had, had all these boxes of uh, slides to, to study and to trace out. And so I carried them with me on the internship and on nights, free nights and weekends. I worked on, on that. I went to the Department of Anatomy across the street from the hospital and, and asked to borrow a microscope and, and a place to work. And, and so I continued doing this at night, much to the dismay of the clinical staff who thought one shouldn't do that. One oh, that shouldn't. kind of moonlighting. Of yes, time, yeah. Right. Now, you had the lab of the former... And I had, yes, I was given the laboratory of the former, uh, of the late uh, chairman of the department who had, um, who had, uh, and had a heart attack while a acting as a... A co well, yes, acting as coast a volunteer defense. coast defense, yes. he was uh, manning a ship in the in the New Haven Harbor. And that man was. There was Allen was his name, yes. and he and Doisy had discovered uh, estrogens and years here we before. Have endocrinology in yeah. store, and a lot of endocrinology yes. papers. Well, the, yes, the department was a was a uh, was really a, an endocrinology. Department that was right. their principal aim, also cancer research. Right. And so, a lot of fish brain sections by yes. some coincidence. Well, How did that but, yes, I don't that know I don't know why this was, but in the department, um, but separated from it because of uh, political maneuvering, right. uh, there was um, H. Saxton Burr, right. who um, who had his own section of neuro anatomy. And uh, with him were two people, Ralph Meter and Ted Bullock, Ted Bullock being the younger at that time. Um, and they had, they were interested, all of, all three of them had worked on fish brains and they were interested in, in, in the brains of fishes. So the chairman of anatomy told me that I uh, suggested I should make contact with them. Um, oh, the chairman have, was Bill Win, uh, Gardner. Bill Gardner. One might have thought that you went to New Haven because of all these No, I didn't know about them. <laughs> it, was the, it was the clinical uh, connections yes. with your clinical faculty that brought you there. Yes, it? yes. I went there because I, uh, 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 I found that metabolic diseases were the most uh, fascinating, and, right. and I was interested in, in having uh, clinical instruction from Peter's and Blake, who were the yeah. chief uh, people in, yeah. the, in the clinical department. We should remind everyone interested that you have written up some of this, uh, these adventures in volume yes. two of that MIT series called? And, uh, Pathways of Discovery. Yes. yes. And, and you entitled your essay in it? A co uh, yes, a concatenation of accidents, because there were a lot of accidents. And here are some examples, yes. aren't there? 
Yes. Now, you were... Well, uh, they, the, uh, just to finish the story about Burr and his uh, colleagues, they had a collection of serial sections of perhaps a hundred different species of brains, uh, uh, fish brains, which had been prepared by Charlton from Missouri. Now, how they got to Yale, I never understood. I don't know. They, they, they didn't... They didn't let me let in no. let me in on this. But these were not perfused brains. No, they were, were they? not perfused. They had been dissected out. Simply, the fish had been had been killed and and uh, the brain dissected out and immersed. And of course, in the dissection, there were um, some deficiencies. Uh -huh. And I was um, the the part of the brain which I was studying at that time. Um, involved uh, the hypothalamic uh, nuclei called the uh, nucleus tuberis, nucle nucleus lateralis tuberis. And uh, this is, this uh, nucleus lies at the base of the brain, just over the pituitary. And when you take out the brain uh, without having fixed it first by perfusion, um, the connective tissue of the meninges may may pull on the on the base of the brain, and when you take it out, it's very fri friable, and the, you may leave part of it behind. And so, according to Charleston's paper, which he published in 1912, I think, um, the species that I had studied didn't contain this nucleus, didn't have this nucleus. But I was able to show by looking at the sections in this collection <laughs> at Yale that, of course, that part of the, the this part of the brain was missing. It was torn off, and the pituitary wasn't there either. So um, his it wasn't exactly accurate to say that the animal didn't have it. It was the specimen didn't have it. Well, an unfixed brain is very soft, very yes, it tears very readily. So you in perfusing them. Well, then, dissecting yes, the what, what you do with a perfused brain, what you do is remove the bones from the brain rather than the brain from the bones. Yes. And that makes all the difference in yeah, the world. Indeed. Now, I have a vivid picture of you in my mind's eye because you describe it so graphically, a kind of a monk's existence. That is, you were an intern <laughs> and you had a little yes. time off. That's and when you had time off, you went right over right. across Cedar Street, That's was it, to right. Sterling and, and uh, worked. Uh, and not in the crowd of, uh, of the faculty because you, this was on evenings and weekends. Right, and nobody was there. The, the building was completely <laughs> empty and, and uh, uh, had access to this rather large room where the microscope was housed and, uh, and w worked there at uh, nights, weekends. No, nobody was around. And because of the the antagonism of the clinical people to this work, I couldn't discuss it with any anybody. Yeah, it was very clear that they quiet. didn't yeah. they didn't think this was appropriate for an intern. A, a cloistered, quiet, yes. secret yes. environment. Another thing I learned, of course, there was the use of the library. Both the the see the Allen Memorial Library in Cleveland was a closed library. You could not go into the stacks. Uh, you were only uh, allowed to look at things that were on display, and otherwise you found what you wanted in an index or in a reference, and you asked the staff to bring it to you, which, of course, they did. But you didn't have this, I don't know, this scholarly pleasure of, of just looking in general. Right, browsing in the browsing. nearby books. Right, yeah. and, and, and at uh, Yale, both the medical library and the and the Sterling uh, Central Library of the of the university were open to to right. people who who had a reason to be there, and so that was extraordinary because uh, one could just wander up and down the right. the uh, aisles looking for things, and you find all sorts of things that that. Um, you didn't know about just simply by pulling them off the shelves. Yeah, serendipity. And uh, that Yale has uh, a strong interest in the history of Cushing's Library. Yes. 
And uh, so that was stimulating your interest in uh, getting back to right. the roots of right. the things. And while you were working alone in those dark uh, yes, uh, the, rooms there, you did have the ghosts of scientists past yes, the, in the corridor. There, there right? was a collection of uh, <clears throat> portraits, uh, most of, mostly engravings, some drawings. Mm -hmm. well, nearly all of them were in, in woodcuts or, uh, or lithographs of portraits of, uh, of scientists, um, especially anatomists and pathologists of the, of the past uh, 2,000 years. Right. I mean, there was a drawing of Galen and, right. and Aristotle and uh, Birkhoff and uh, Metchnikoff and uh, uh, right. all of these, uh, you know, everybody. Coming up to modern times, there weren't any photographs, though. No, no. Not of Aristotle and Galen. No, nor no, uh, no but I mean of contemporary people. Yep. That's so right. the, these, there was a, a row of these on each side of the corridor. It would, it, since nobody was around, you couldn't help but pause and yeah. look at them. Yes, I, I so. know those. Now, this is, you'd brought along your slides from Cleveland. Yes. And that's largely what you were working on, plus these sections of other brains, yeah. with or without. Well, though I didn't spend much time with the other, no. with the other brains, because that wasn't available work. to me on anyway. free time. So you were now... Uh, uh, working on the continuing project of which you started under the showers. Right. But this is going to be a year of internship, but now residency, you go back. Well, then I, I went back to to Cleveland and was a resident in medicine at, at uh, Lakeside uh, Uni University Hospitals and became a, I had a, 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 a contemporaneous appointment as a, a fellow in anatomy. And during that time, I worked with uh, Arnold Lazaro, who had come to from Chicago at, during the year when I was away, yeah. and uh, he and I worked on aloxan diabetes, and uh, during during that time, and again I was doing this on the free time on the weekends and the right. evenings. Now Arnold wants to go on with a great career in, yes. in diabetic research, the yeah. pancreas at right. Minnesota. Right. Yeah. That was after I left. Yeah, but <coughs> here's endocrinology again. Correct. Nearby. Yes. Now, but here we are coming uh, with your residency soon. The war is going to be over. Yes. Well, fortunately for me, the war was over by the, by the, when, the, the year when my residency was finishing. And, but, but the draft of doctors was not over. And well, I was called into the service in February of 1946. Yes, given their, their due. They'd educated yeah. you. Yeah. Well, they only had paid for the last uh, semester, actually. Uh -huh. By the time we got into uh, the ASTP, it was the it was really the end of my. Uh, so you're off for a two-year stint. Yes. So I had two years in the army, and during that time, I was sent to um, to Japan, which was extremely interesting. Uh, but medically and and scientifically, of course, it didn't help. No. But that's all right. But that opened your eyes to Japan to another and the culture. Japanese pe yes. people and their culture, yes. which has been a continuing Right, and I've been interested in them ever since. Yes. Yeah. Indeed, I knew I, nothing about it when I went there, nothing right. at all, because I was sure that they would send me to Germany. Right. But they didn't. <laughs> but you got to know the Japanese people in yes. what was then a small village. Uh, yes. We, uh, the the, where the was hospital that? was the 128th Station Hospital, which was about... I don't know, perhaps 60 miles away from Tokyo, uh, d uh, westward of Tokyo uh, and Yo Yokohama. In order to go to Tokyo, we had to take the train and go through Yokohama yeah. to So, so to it wasn't Tokyo. on the bay there between those no, two it cities. No, it was inland. Yeah. Inland. And this was a tiny village with only half a dozen houses at the most, maybe only four, and, right. a, and a railway stop. But yeah. it had this enormous... Um, military hospital, which had been the hospital for the Imperial Army before. Um, and it was not far from, uh, from a, a, a military base called Zama, which became the staging base for all the activities in, in the, uh, all the American military activities of the Far East. So all the troops who were going home, who were who were being demobilized came through Zama before they were sent to uh, back to the states, 
And those people who were coming to the Far East to replace the, the occupation troops passed through Zalma. So we, we had this big turnover, and, and uh, the kinds of diseases we saw were quite interesting. There was one period of, of two or three months when we saw an, uh, uh, we had a, a shipment of, uh, of soldiers 18 and 19 years old who came from America and had never been exposed to childhood diseases and someone on the ship had measles or was carrying uh, all these things, measles, chickenpox, uh, scarlet fever or tonsillitis of one sort or another. and. Um, and within a week of their arrival in Zama, of course, there was this epidemic of, of all these childhood diseases, and they were all sent to us to take care of. So that was quite something new, because in medical school, we may have only seen one or two patients. So we, all these diseases weren't, weren't around anymore. Yes, and travel is broadening. Yes, and so we didn't know them. Yeah. Um, well, now, anyway, this is, that was, this is something that was for clinical medicine, right? but really that's a two-year interval that was not rich in the, the way you had been going. Yeah, no, that was an interruption of the career, but, but it was but, necessary you know, for the... But if one visits you in your home in Concord, one sees that the Japanese things have yes. been with you. One sees Japanese yeah. prints and the yeah. bonsai. Yes. I remember that well, I didn't know much them. about bonsai at that time. I think I may have heard of them, but I didn't know anything about them. Right. Um, but Japanese prints I began collecting then, because right. I went ar at that time I went around and, yes. and started collecting them. But you're going to, uh, later in your career, go back to Japan, right. and Japanese scientists will come and work with you. Right. So that was a beginning of real things, yes. so two years of busy doing your army duty and medical. Right. But then right. when you came back, you had already been planning, uh, actually, before yes. you went, hadn't you? Well, I had already received a fellowship to, to spend a year or more with uh, uh, with Albert Claude at the Rockefeller. But when I was called into the Army, this was postponed. And the, the fellowship, the National Research Council, which was the, the source of the fellowship, um, very uh, kindly uh, agreed that I could take it up when I came back. And that was what I did. I returned. Uh, I got out of the Army in November. No, for... Or, or, first week or so of, de of December in 1947. And uh, after spending a, a, a few weeks at home, I then went to New York to start up my fellowship right. with Albert Claude. And that was, that was my first tour at the, at the Rockefeller, oh, which I was see. also quite enlightening. <laughs> yes, well now you found Claude in whose laboratory? Well, he was in the laboratory of J.B. Murphy. At, at the time. J.B. Murphy was a cancer um, um, researcher, an investigator of cancer, um, who had been trained and had worked before in, in, in Peyton Rouse's laboratory. By this time, Peyton Rouse had, had uh, officially retired, but he was still there, and we used to see him daily. He was to lunch in the famous yeah, he. We would see him at lunch and talk with talk with him. He often sat at the same table where we right. we sat. But you weren't tempted to switch back onto the bacteriological, no, microbiological. No, no. By this work. time, by this time, I was settled into into the well into cytology, really, because yeah. my interest in the nervous system came by way of being interested in structure right. of cells, right. and uh, so. Uh, that was what I was concerned with. I went to Albert Claude hoping to learn differential centrifugation, which he had developed to a high art. And, uh, but it turned out that this was the year, uh, well, Claude worked on a schedule in which every other year he did morphological work with, the, with microscopy. And on the alternate years, he did biochemistry and differential centrifugation. And because of my uh, uh, delayed schedule, I arrived on the year when he was working cytologically in, in uh, uh, 
a microscopy and not doing differential centrifugation. Which you would have preferred. Which I would was which I wanted to learn. Which strikes us as strange, knowing what a great anatomist you've become. That would have sent that. Would have been yeah. Notes. Well, but so, that was yeah. what I I thought was uh, was the most. Uh, I thought that was the direction, and of course it has proved to be the right. direction of the in the in right. of the future, um, but. Also, electron microscopy was there, and, yes. and that was the year when he wanted to do electron microscopy. Of course, the methods were impossible. I right. mean, you could not do uh, satisfactory microscopy of tissue sections at that time, yes. in, that, in that year. So you were uh, starting a lot of little projects so, from here on right. in, some of which would not which really pay which off. Wouldn't, which wouldn't work. Um, one thing that's important for my later career is that in the same laboratory, in the same room, in the next desk was George Pilotti, who had, who had arrived <laughs> from uh, uh, Romania uh, just the, during the previous eight or nine months. And after spending a few um, months in with uh, Robert Chambers in the uh, at New York University, he connected with with Albert Claude and was received into his laboratory. So he was already there working on the Golgi apparatus in one of his big busts, in which he showed that the Golgi apparatus was an irretrievable artifact, and um, and so he was working on this subject right next to me, and. And this is uh, this, uh, the, you know, that's quite important for anybody's uh, youngster's career to have Claude and Pilati right next door to you, and then around the corner is Keith Porter, and um, um, I lost his first name, Hogaboom, the who had 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 had, had, uh, had worked on. Uh, on isolating mitochondria from from uh, tissue cells. Um, what an assembly! So you know this is this is, and then of course you go to the to the dining room. There you find people like uh, like um, uh, Len or uh, Michaelis, um, Laurenti Deneau, uh, Laurenti Deneau uh, Gasser. Um, oh, I don't know. You could name just dozens of. Right of very famous uh, people. So this is uh, quite eye-opening. And they would linger about that. Yes, and you could have right. conversations with them, you could or, li or listen to their own right. conversations with their uh, colleagues and students. And um, so it's, it, it, this is quite an experience, aside from what you may have learned uh, scientifically. Well, now, I think uh, you, you have something to uh, thank uh, Adolf Hitler and the fascists. And the yeah, well, for. reluctant thanks for that. <laughs> but mean, they said we, we could have done this without him. Yeah, right. The communists took over Romania and George yes, Pilate came. Yes, right. Yeah. Now, but you really were working closest with Claude. Yes. That, with, that this was, a, um, we, we developed this kind of partly father-son relationship, but also equ equal. He was a... A wonderful person, uh, and because he worked late at night, um, we would always go to almost every day. We would go to dinner together, and yeah. then come back and work some more. And and uh, so, this was a very intimate uh, relationship. We would find. I lived at International House on the west side near Columbia, yeah. uh, uptown. Uptown. It's at one hundred and twenty third Street, and. Uh, um, so we would go across town together around midnight or so. In those days, it was relatively safe. Right. And, uh, and then take the subway going north. And he, he, would, he would continue. I would get off at a, right. wh whatever it was, 116th or 100, 125th. I can't remember anymore what so, the stop was. Yeah, so he was a kind of a father, brother, yes. uh, a person in the lab technically, but a broadly cultured uh, Oh, yes, tremendously cultured, person. interested in everything. And so we had one, during that time, one of the experiences I remember 
one of my f f favorite memories was the time when Pilati realized that I had seen George Inesco at, at Oberlin and, and um, that I enjoyed his uh, rhapsodies, Romanian rhapsodies and so right. on. He said, would you like to meet him? And he took he he arranged uh, the Inescos lived. It must have been I didn't know it at that time, but it must have been the Dakota apartment on West uh, Central Park. And um, every so often they would have a soiree. And so uh, George took me to this soiree, and I met uh, uh, both. Inesco and and uh, his wife and and there was a and they had a, a, a chamber music uh, concert with Inesco playing the piano and and several I don't remember the other people who were who were the artists who played violin and cello and so on they played a foray uh, uh, quint quartet I think it was um, and a couple of other pieces but sitting in front of me was was um, Chrysler, who was, you know, moving along with the, keeping time with the music. I mean, the, the, that sort High of society. Or yeah, it was a tremendous experience. Yeah. It's just being there. Wow. Now, this was the first of your tours. Yes. In the well, Albert Claude returned to Belgium as uh, head of the Jules Bordet Institute, and so I needed to find a job, um, and I. Uh, re, -init re uh, open my uh, contact with uh, Bill Gardner at Yale, who offered me a position, and I became an instructor there, beginning in January of 1949. 49. Yes. So this is going to start a period of about 10 years or so. Well, I, I stayed at Yale until 1956, uh, when I moved to NIH. Yeah. So during that time my um, uh, mostly was concerned with uh, teaching I, I found that they, they didn't have adequate slides for neuroanatomy so I had to make I, I made slides for the class and um, I also taught gross and and uh, histology so all those three courses and did some lecturing in uh, in the in the uh, the endocrinology course, which was an yes, elective. Now that's, uh, that's an intensive schedule. Yeah, it was all pretty, those courses. pretty and strong. There aren't many anatomists today who would uh, be taking on neuro growth mm. and stuff. But in addition to that, I, we, I gave a, a, uh, an elective every, every uh, spring semester in what we called analytical cytology. Yeah. And this was done together with, uh, with Henry Bunting, who became a great friend of mine during this wow. period. He was in pathology. What a prince of a man. Yes. So um, when he died in 1953, late in 53, um, I then the next year devoted, the, dedicated the course to him and, and invited a whole series of lecturers to come. This was supported by the department very nicely. Yeah. And, uh, um, and this produced a volume. And that, yes, from that we got a, a volume which was called Frontiers in Cytology. Yes, and if one looks at the table of contents, you see them uh, Yale, but heavy Harvard contingent. Yes, there are pe all the people, we tried to get all the people who had known and worked with or been yes. uh, appreciative of yes. Henry Bunting. Yes, well, so. I remember him around the Harvard department. He was, George Wislocki was a great admirer yes. of his, and we all loved him there yeah. in ways, and, and his wife, Polly. Yes. Who had such a good so also. that that uh, was a sad experience. But then in uh, in but Henry and I had shared uh, an electron microscope together, and in 1953, in preparation for the arrival of that microscope, um, I accepted an invitation from George Pilati to go back to the Rockefeller. And it was during that time that probably my most uh, seminal, uh, if you want to use such words, uh, you dis may. discoveries were, were made because w we, um, we undertook to, to examine the nerve cell at the electron microscope level, which, which was, had been tried before but unsuccessfully. And at this, by this time, we now had the techniques. We had 
a, a good way of fixing tissue, which Polanyi had in, invented, That's or introduced osmium tetroxide, tetroxide yeah. with, with a buffer. Yeah. And we had a, a sensible way of uh, embedding the tissue, which was in the methacrylate, right. um, and then of sectioning with a glass knife. And we had a microtome, which both Claude and Porter had contributed to. Contributed to. Um, That's the Bloom Porter. The eventually. Porter Bloom. Yeah. It became known as the Porter Bloom microtome, and um, so uh, the methods were now yeah. suddenly available. In addition to that, of course, the microscope had vastly improved. Yeah. It was much more improved later, but yeah. it, there was a a considerable jump between 1948, when I first right. used the microscope, so many and 1953. Yes. And so we, we, so it was in, I, I went to, um, to New York for six months and uh, spent all the time there, although it's surprising how many other things we did too, right. but um, studying uh, the nerve, uh, nerve cell and very rather quickly uh, found a, a decent way to fix the tissue. You always have to make adjustments for your particular tissue. And we studied, um, uh, discover what the architecture of the nissel substance was. And in those original pictures, we saw neurofilaments and microtubules and the Golgi apparatus, although we because of Pilates' previous uh, uh, studies, we didn't want to recognize it as the Golgi apparatus. That took a conversion. Didn't that it? took a kind of conversion, and then it was a year or so before that happened. Uh, and then, uh, and when that, when those were completed, we I then set about searching for the synapse. And we we knew we had a good idea what the synapse should look like because of classical work by. Um, by Helt and others at the end of the 19th century had shown that the synapse contains a high concentration of mitochondria. And so this should be very obvious in the EM. And of course, once we got reasonable fixation of the right region, there they were, of course, the, the nerve endings um, seated on dendrites and, and, and cell bodies and with collections of mitochondria, and new structures that we hadn't, no one had seen before, the synaptic vesicles. Right. So um, in a, in, this was in July when I, when I came upon the first synapses. So, you know, it's only three, four months. One has really done an awful lot in that, right. in that time. And now, Pilate had some uh, sort of adumbrations of this picture. Yes, Pilate had made, uh, before I came, Pilate had made some pictures of, of uh, cerebellar cortex in which there were structures that um, had these components in them, but we misidentified who was what. And it wasn't until later in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the fall, in August or so, after I had seen single, he, what, what he had found were the glomeruli, in the cerebellar cortex, which is a very complicated synapse, and we had misidentified who was what in, in looking at them, as well as the, the, the technique was not as good as it became a few months later. So um, uh, when I found actual boutons ending on, on motor cells in the abducens nucleus, now we had the idea, we had the, uh, a solid idea of which profile was presynaptic, which one was postsynaptic, and what they, what they contained, finally. So then we could reinterpret the, the cerebellar glomeruli. Wow. All right, but now that didn't leap into the headlines in the New York Times, did it? No. Even when you tried to present it? No, Tell us we, about we that. present, yes, we present, well, we submitted an abstract to the uh, um, Electron Microscope Society of America, which met early in November in the Poconos. We submitted an abstract about the nerve cell, but then subsequently we found out that that oh, when the abstracts uh, were printed and and we received a copy of them, we found that that um, De Robertis claimed to have a synapse in the acoustic nuclei that he was going to present there. So. Uh, 
I changed or I altered the plan presentation to include a couple of slides that I had of the of the synapse. As it turned out at the meeting, what De Robertis showed was not a synapse at all. It was simply a myelinated nerve fiber that was close to a cell body. It was not anything like the synapse. Whereas what we showed at the last uh, two minutes of my 12-minute presentation were true synaptic junctions in the abducens nucleus. And, you know, Frank Schmidt was the chairman of the meeting. They were also, everybody was, was there of any consequence in, in this field. And it received no, uh, no recognition, no notice. But he recognizes De Robertis erroneous picture as being a true synapse. Schmidt well, yes, but at the end of Frank's, uh, at the end of De Robertis' talk, Frank uh, said, well, now we know what the synapse looks like, right. which, of course, was uh, uh, exactly right. the opposite. And poor De Robertis really did, uh, failed to even see later. Yes. He continued yeah. to believe that he had... Well, he uh, continued to claim that he had seen the synapse first, but, but that isn't, it, it um, unfortunately isn't true. The evidence is clear. Now, you presented this also down then, in Galveston. At yes, Arlington. then in the spring, we presented this as two separate uh, uh, papers. I gave the cell body, and Pallotti gave the, the synaptic junction as, a, as a s independent papers at the, at, at the meeting of the anatomists. And by that time, it, it, the audience was appropriate for right. recognizing what they were seeing. Because so, they really were anatomists. Yeah, right. well, and they were, the, they were the neuroanatomists who were yes, there. That's right, moment. ready for it. Well, now we must, this is also delicious. Well, we yeah, we've only got to, to 1953. Let's hit some highlights <laughs> ahead here. So here you are down, uh, that was really an interval in your Yale Yes, tour. at Yale. And, and then, then you went on. Then I, I well, th once, once uh, of course, we got this far along in electron microscopy, then the point was to continue it. And, and to learn everything we could about the nerve cell. Yeah. And um, so the next attack was to find out what all the parts of the nerve cell look like. How do you distinguish dendrites from exones? And, and how do you tell what's glia? And, and how are those processes distinguished from neural processes? And so on. And that took years to do. And it continued even after, well, especially after I left Yale and moved to to NIH. At, at NIH, I had the, the freedom or the, the possibility of, of uh, working out a method that would allow us to answer all those questions. That is, you needed a method that would provide you with the nerve cell in situ, in its place, and complete, whereas our previous methods involved um, uh, chopping up the nerve tissue into tiny little fragments in a drop of osmic acid, and now or total orientation is lost. Uh, the the, the uh, damage that you do by chopping it up is now preserved, and uh, uh, and, and it becomes, uh, to to a large extent, guessing what you're looking at specifically what you're looking at. You needed a method, which I had already learned from the Shars, of having the nerve cell in its proper place right. and intact. And that required perfusion. Right. However, perfusion with osmic acid is almost always a failure. So it, 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 aside from being toxic and extremely expensive. Right. So I needed to be in a situation where I could manage that. So working for the government was a little bit easier to manage the expense. And um, one could, we could construct a table which would have a forced um, uh, vacuum which would draw the fumes away from us and, and so on. We, we did this sort of thing. And in the, in the late uh, 50s, arrived at a successful program for perfusing the, the brain of rats and goldfish we didn't try any. We did, we did one or two rabbits, but it was mostly rats and, and fishes that we did. Um, and you were looking for places in the nervous system where you would have these nerve cells uh, on the surface 
near the fourth ventricle. But well, that ventricle was also. that was before perfusion. Now yeah. we wouldn't need to depend yeah. only on places where they're that near was the surface. Yes, them, yeah. but if, when you perfuse them, you can expect that yeah. anywhere the, in the in the brain the the nerve cell should be intact, and so that was very helpful because it allowed us to distinguish without any question what was a dendrite and what was an axon because you now saw it the way you do in the light microscope. And um, also it allowed us to find uh, later the initial segment, which is a very restricted region and only occurs in one. The, its architecture is typical of only this one place in the whole nerve cell, no matter how big the nerve cell is. Just where the cell body, where the axon starts. The yes, where segment. the axon starts. Yeah. And um, um, also it allows, uh, allowed us um, to study the different kinds of synapses that are on, on, a, on a cell. Um, because now they're, the fixation is so much better yeah. since it's in, in there. You can, you can make more uh, refined distinctions. Right when the fixation is more successful. Whereas before, one looked for the places where the fixation was reasonably good and ignored all the other parts of the tissue where everything was torn and broken up and, and, um, and inadequate. So also, the distinctions of the glial cells, that became, the perfusion be, uh, was a, a necessary step in deciding who was who among the glia. Now, this was a good setting for this work, wasn't it? Right. And very supported right. by uh, Bill Wendell. Yes, uh, by the... By and Seymour the, Ketty. And Seymour Ketty was uh, chief of the, of the basic sciences yeah. for the Institute. Right. And then later Livingston, who was... Yeah. Who took so we could dwell a long time on that. Yeah. But that was now getting you to be uh, admired everywhere for the, the beauty and the clarity of your preparations, the fixation and the thin slices and, and all. And so you're ready to move on. Uh, well, then I was offered the position at Harvard by Don Fawcett, whom I had met at, at, the, at the Rockefeller because he, his tour with uh, Keith Porter overlapped with my tour with Halati uh, in 1953. And so he invited me to, to come and, and, and uh, take over neuroanatomy in the department that he was forming in, in 1959. But they were rebuilding their building, and I had just had the experience of waiting for a building to be built so that I could uh, work in it. So I said I wouldn't come until the building was ready. This is building B. They just gutted it and yeah, put floors. Right. They had high ceilings in those early right. days. They inter interfloored the, the so building. So you continued at NIH So I stayed in NIH until 1961 when, yeah. when uh, I All took right. up the appointment at Harvard. Yeah, B1, which used to be the old gross anatomy right. wing of that right. building. Mine. That's right, on and the uh, second floor. And I had a very beautiful office lined with cherry right. wood and bookshelves. Right. And, and what kind of a life was that for you then as you well, started the in Well, uh, the first dozen, the first, I would say, t almost 10 years was really wonderful because it was a group of, uh, the, the department was populated by young people who were committed and terribly interested in their subject and it was it was bubbling with enthusiasm and energy and and uh, we all got along well together and knew each other and it was a it was a really delightful period also very productive because there were so many new things being found and that was a time when the, the electron microscope was just growing right. by leaps and bounds. Uh, everything you turned your hand to showed something new. I so, remember you were describing that as paradise. Yes, it was a really was wonderful fun. time. And also, the, the teaching program that I was involved in was, was a, uh, a block uh, program involving uh, neuroanatomy and the neurophysiology in, the, in what became the neurobiology department, so that we, we uh, taught for a period of uh, eight weeks yeah. together by interdigitating our, our two uh, subjects. And well, this was the time of the so-called new curriculum. I was there. Yeah, that was we the first new it. curriculum. <laughs> yes, and that was, it, to all of us when we were planning that, neurosciences was the inevitable yes. integrated Yes, well, it, it is an integrated, it's an integrating 
subject by its nature. and an integrating system, so it was natural. And, 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 and that was the milieu for you, for your teaching, yeah. too. And, and that changed, unfortunately. Yes, in 1968, the, the, the enthusiasm for this block teaching uh, declined because the other courses, not the neuro people, but the other courses felt that it was they were being slighted in, the, in, yeah. in one way or another. And they wanted more independence from the, for their department and their discipline than the, than the blocks permitted. So they destroyed the blocks, except for neuroscience. Neuroscience was still a block, but they wanted it to be taught in the summer. And the neurobiology department said, well, we go to Woods Hole in the summer. And so they pulled out. And this, there were some residues, but it, from there on, it was downhill. Right. And, but you had, in addition to the uh, main curriculum, you had your advanced courses that you were offering also, and postdocs. Yes, and we and graduate students. Yes, we had. Of course, there, were, there, there. That was one of the reasons for going to Harvard that I could have students again, right. although. Uh, <laughs> my fill of them at Yale, I, I guess I missed them. But these were advanced students. Your, your first yes. PhD student was? Uh... Well, well, my first PhD student was, was who the first one to get his degree was Milton Brightman, at, uh, but that was from Yale. Yeah. And, and he went on to the NIH. And he right? went on to the NIH. He was there before you, as a matter of fact. You're right. He came the year before. Yeah. yeah. But there at Harvard with your graduate But at, at Harvard, I had, I had uh, uh, Two or three graduate students. Two, two of them in particular, uh, Margaret uh, Reed Byers and yeah. Susan uh, <coughs> Billings Gagliardi, who who got their degrees, and uh, otherwise it was mostly uh, postdoctoral yeah. people. And among these, there were some who stand out very, very strongly. For example, there's for example, there's. Um, uh, Alan Peters, with whom uh, I've continued a collaboration ever ever since right, then, and we wrote we wrote our uh, yep. this this book, which came out in nineteen right. well, in nineteen seventy, is the first edition, and yeah. this is the third edition in nineteen ninety one. Beautiful books, and you know, Sandy, and I. I am so impressed with the introductions of these, the writing. I think that any educated layman, not even a, a science student, could read those with intelligence, with understanding. Yep. Well, yep. that's uh, kind of you, because that's just one of the chapters that I wrote. But <laughs> yes, but, um, but now, so here you have Alan Peters, and then a certain young woman appeared on the well, scene. Well, yes, but before before the certain young woman is is. Uh, is Constantino Sotelo, oh, yes. no, close uh, who came who came from uh, Paris, and uh, um, and he's continued to be a very good friend right. ever since then. And then, as you say, in 1969, um, uh, Victoria uh, Chan. At that time, her her name was Curtis. Um, uh, joined me as a postdoc, and we subsequently became a man and wife. And uh, so uh, when she, d d and we worked together for, what, what is it, so, appro approximately 10, 11 years before um, she went off into other, into other subjects in other places. Well, but, so you don't have to boast for her. Let me just tell you what she meant. Yeah, well, she, she is a phenomenon. Yes, she, she is. Was a, she came, of course, became a medical student. Right. That was after I'd left, but I heard about her. Summa cum laude. Uh, yes. My word, one of the very few from Harvard Medical School. And during that time, she, she uh, uh, did uh, a tremendous uh, uh, amount of uh, work on the, on the dentate nucleus in the cerebellum. And which was published as a book. Yes, because uh, she'd, uh, of course, been a graduate student at Tufts and had right. come working with you, so she'd got it launched into research and got the a prize, a prestigious prize for her research when she graduated. Yes, yes, she received the Rethnik uh, Prize on graduation. And so that was an enormously productive cooperation between uh, you two. Yes, and when we, well, we did this book on the cerebellar cortex. Uh, together, yeah. um, I wrote 
wrote it and she provided most of the illustrations, including the drawings, the drawings that the one of which is on the on the cover. But uh, um, so it, this was a very productive uh, collaboration and, and uh, was uh, extremely good. Un unfortunately, it did not advance her career at, at, at Harvard, and uh, she, she had eventually to be in a had to different leave. Department of neuroscience. Yes, not yours. right, right. So uh, that's a somewhat sadder yes. uh, result. You know, we've had the signal that we've got to come to an end here within a few <laughs> minutes, yeah, and right. we think that. Uh, uh, you, you had uh, went on there at the Harvard Medical School, retired in yes. 1989. Uh, well, um, in 19, uh, 1980, I began to uh, be the chief editor for the Journal of Comparative Neurology. And uh, so in knowing that in 1989 I would be retiring, um, I arranged that I could move the journal to my home. So in the, the summer, uh, well, actually, it was in the spring of 89, we moved the journal to, to uh, my home with the staff and the equipment and, and uh, have continued there. And I will continue that until the end of this year. When That'll be about 13 years or yes. so. Yes. Long and uh, right. enormous labor. My word, that journal has grown. You know, the, well, when we first started, the journal received about 300 papers a year, and now it receives about 700 papers a year, right. new papers. Yes. And uh, it takes a, a lot of uh, work to But you've done that so do effectively. Uh, you're two charming uh, co-worker women there, and your, yes. and your staff right in your home, looking out on a little pond with mallard ducks and occasional <laughs> blue heron, and your bonsai, and your yeah. grand, uh, Steinway grand piano playing Bach for me of an evening. And uh, Prince, that's a, that's, I like to picture you there. Well, well uh, that's where I expect to end my life. I, well, and you have a couple of projects ahead. Yes, well, I want to write a history of uh, neurocytology, which I started to do in, in 1961, but they have kept delaying ever since. Right, but now you'll be free to do uh, that. I hope that I can do that. And, and another one? And perhaps an autobiography. An autobiography. Now, that's, a, that's a, just planning that. But perhaps that's a good note to end on. Those who have enjoyed hearing more about that, look for the sequel when your <laughs> autobiography appears. Sandy, Thank I you. think you and I have enjoyed this. We hope others will, too. You and I intend to go on with this, uh, thinking toward that autobiography. Yes.